Hi, everybody. Welcome to a very special episode of Am I the Asshole podcast. I'm joined today by an incredibly special guest. I mean, this person, maybe not specifically, but generally is referenced on the AITA subreddit. God, must be thousands of times a day. That's right, folks. A therapist. We welcome Lindsay, a therapist from Chicago, to the program. Hey, how's it going? Lindsay, it's such a pleasure. Thank you so much for reaching out. I believe you reached out to me and said that you thought uh, I could receive therapy well which was a relief or, or you referenced the fact that I'd, I'd had several bad therapists. You, you had heard an episode about that. Yeah. You brought <laughs> up that you've had just some really crummy therapists, like who don't like respond to you or like text you back or they kind of just give you these like platitudes. Like it sounds like they weren't really listening. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't think I've had a single therapist besides the one I have now who's crushing it. Um, that I actually feel was like a really good listener, observer, payer of attention. (laughs) It's tough out there. I mean, yeah, I guess I think that's a a thing that we talk about a lot because, you know, some people are told the classic get therapy. They get therapy and they have a a middling experience or even worse, a a, a terrible experience. And yeah, what would you say to those people? Oh, yeah. I think there are a lot of bozos out there and (laughs) like at any job, you know. Right, right. We get this idea that like there can't be a bad therapist or that like a therapist is an all knowing person and they're a human being. They're a therapist probably 40 hours a week, maybe. And the rest of the time they're a person. So they have flaws. Mm -hmm. Um, They have biases and just not everyone is that good at their job. And I think it's kind of one of those careers that some people get into it for the wrong reasons. Um, That could be a lot of different reasons. Yeah. Yeah, I think there are a lot of things that contribute to that. But I think a lot of people, they might go to a therapist that either kind of isn't great or just not Mm -hmm. a good fit. And people really personalize that. And they say, oh, I'm not going to do well in therapy or I'm just too much of a mess to get any help. And it really impacts people and it like keeps them from going back. Like it can be kind of traumatizing because you're going to therapy because you're in a real need to either understand something or to heal from something. And if you go to someone and open up like that and what they give you is either really nothing or it's hurtful or it's re-traumatizing, why would you want to seek therapy again? A hundred percent. I mean, my my therapist now who I like kind of opened up on she's solutions oriented, um, which I'm very for, obviously. We're, We're obviously digging for solutions, but... There have been a few times where I've been like, I think let's slow our roll a bit on the solving. I think I need to be heard and understood a little bit. And so I've had to kind of call her out. But that, that's the great thing about her is that if I if I direct her, she can really take that and understand it and work with it. And so, and she, you know, she's listening. Yeah, no, that's great that you can feel comfortable giving her feedback. Part of like solution focused is like, yeah, having goals, but like there's also like the need to be understood is really powerful. And when we get out of like situations that are difficult or we don't feel understood or we feel judged or just demoralize, like feeling understood can be such a relief and so powerful in terms of just healing and moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I definitely wasn't understood. I actually wrote a list of my bad therapists. I wasn't even including the one who ghosted me. I forgot. That's a oh, fifth God. one. This is my, I've had five therapists that I've, that I've gone through. Um, okay. In the first one's defense, it was 200 a session and I just had to pay 200 oh. a session. So like that was way, way out of my price range, but I was like, I need to do this. Like, uh, and, but the thing that actually made me really be like, okay, I think I'm out with this guy is I was on a thread with him going on about something and he just really left turn out of nowhere just goes, well, what's your, you have a weak impression of your father. What's your first memory with him? And I was like, okay, dickhead Freud, like, what are you doing? Like that, we yeah. weren't even, we were, like I mentioned my dad, but like that wasn't the thrust of what I was saying. So it really felt like I wasn't being understood or listened to. It felt like a total curveball, not a bad line of inquiry, obviously, but just like, what are you doing? Yeah. I mean, I can see feeling like dismissed by that. <laughs> Yeah, it felt like he wasn't really listening. He heard father, and then he's like, "Let's let's go down the uh, childhood memories path right now." And it's like, dude, that's come on. What are you? You're not present. You're not being present. Yeah, and I think stuff like that can cause people to put emphasis on things that like it, you can get distracted almost, right? Like you were talking about something completely different. And he brought up your father, and you're like, "Wait, wait, wait! I'm talking about something else now. I have now there's something with my father. What is this? Like, yes, yeah, it yes. can be confusing." 
Totally, totally. Fo- I think focus. I think focus is a huge is a huge part of it. Feeling like you're being focused on, and then you know, feeling like you're meeting out a particular issue, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's why so much of it is like that. We learn is just reflective, right? You know, letting people know. Okay, I hear what you're saying, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think I crave that a lot. Um, I guess since you brought it up, my one thing I do, and I've noticed because I've had three COVID breakups, is I do write everything down. You mm-hmm. know, and it's it's very compulsive in the early phases. It's and that, that's kind of how I I process. Like I need to write literally every memory I can come up with. I don't even necessarily go back to it. Uh, what do you make of that practice? Does it help? Do you feel like it helps you? Tremendously. Yeah. And like, once you get it out, are you still ruminating on those things that you've gotten out? No, no. Um, and my best understanding of it is based on the things I don't write down because there's a couple things obviously I forget or there's just nothing for me to associate into. And like, then I'll be struck with a memory and I'll get very emotional because mm-hmm. it's like, oh, that, that was like a leaf unturned. And I guess, I guess part of it is like when a relationship ends, you sort of have to re-render every memory you have with this person in this new context, which is like, it's over. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I went through a COVID breakup too. They suck. Um, (laughs) they're not fun. (laughs) Yeah. It was a blast. (laughs) And I think like, right. Like, first of all, when you're going through a breakup, like, and I think it's been discussed enough that it's grief and Hmm. it's a different, you're going to have those stages. It's not linear. I think sometimes we want a lot of control over our emotions when we're going through something like that. Right. We want to just say like, I'm going to get it all out and then it's out there and that part is gone. And then I'm going to go work out and then I'm going to do this. And uh, these memories aren't going to come up. I'm not going to have any moments where I feel like I'm just going to start <laughs> crying in the middle of Target or I have to go to the bathroom in a meeting at work, right? Or like, it's going to happen. It's messy. And right. grief is really right. messy. And like, even biologically, what we go through when we go through a breakup, like all that like oxytocin that our brain is making, mm. it's just gone all of a sudden. And so we're going through like a withdrawal. It's like going through a drug withdrawal in some ways. And So not only are we like we have I mean, there are studies that have been done. They have run people through like MRI machines who were, you know, quote unquote, you know, heartbroken and even just showing them pictures of um, like their exes. It like Mm. they had this like um, the imaging, like the parts of the brain responsible for like reward. It like lit up. Yes. Um, And so like but you're also getting this reward, but looking at it and going, this person's not in my life anymore. So there's like a lot of pain. Um, a right. lot of studies show what our, our entire body goes through. So breakups too, they're really, really physical on top of being like just emotional and missing that person. And also like think about the routine that we're out of. Like we are such creatures of habit. So mm-hmm. not only are we kind of evaluating ourselves, what did I do wrong? What could I have done better? Like there's this whole other level to it of like a routine being gone this like physical symptoms that we go through because I think any both of us could say I think anyone listening could say that like when you're really heartbroken or any breakup Mm. you it feels like something bigger than just being sad It, it feels really heavy yeah I mean it's I I have met I mean I've tried to write comedy about breaking up and it's very difficult but I think one thing that that's fascinates me is that it is physical, you know, and I think about the classical concept of the heart, you know, like we used to, like, you've got heart. There's this whole like language on, obviously it's kind of all in your brain, but you do feel it. You feel it in your, your physical heart. And I don't know why that is, but like, that's, there's like an ache. Yeah. I mean, our, our brains register physical pain and emotional pain pretty much identically. So Sometimes our body just doesn't know that it's emotional pain. It thinks that we're in physical pain. That's why sometimes like it turns off our like desire to eat our sleeping. That's yes. all turned off because our body, our brain is telling us I'm in danger. So yeah. uh, I don't have time to eat or do pleasurable things. I'm in danger. Something is wrong. So right. it's, it's, it's tricky. You're not always thinking clearly when that stuff is going on. So like a therapist, like friends and family are great. Routine is great. But sometimes having someone to reflect on that in therapy and figure out like, really mapping out what's going on can be helpful. 
Yeah, I think so. I, I think another point or a thing that occurred to me a lot is the intellectual versus emotional gap, which I think is very aligned with what you're saying. It's like people would be like, well, don't you think it's a good thing that it's over? And I'm like, yes, you know, it is. And I intellectually know that because, you know, it wasn't a good relationship um, and that's why it ended. But understanding that is there's such a huge gap between that and feeling it, which takes so much longer. Yeah, I think that's that's a big part of it, too, is like when we're going through anything, whether it's like a breakup or just depression, it is hard to separate like the intellectual from the emotional, because Mm -hmm. if we feel really bad or like we're feeling like we're a piece of shit, like it's really hard not to intellectualize that or like to look for proof or evidence Mm -hmm. for those things, you know, like I'm feeling really bad. Okay, it must be. Let me like seek out reasons that I'm feeling bad. Let me find um, <laughs> evidence. Let me comb through every time that someone told me I was a piece of shit and put this case against myself together. I guess that's where everyone goes to a, to a guilty, reflective place. That I mean, and that's a good thing because you do need to learn from the experience. You do, and I think there's like with anything that happens, a breakup. The, I mean, breakups are kind of the big one. I think we're seeing that a lot during this pandemic. But there's reflection, and then there's like ruminating. And I think sometimes people get too much into the ruminating. I know myself have had trouble with that. Ooh, interesting. So the rumination uh, reflection gap. You find yourself thinking about something and you're like, I've thought about this so much. What am I still hoping to achieve by thinking about this? Like I, I had a therapist describe it to me like um, a medicine cabinet, right? Where you have hmm. that's, that has a mirrors on it. And when you open it up and you look inside and it's just endless reflections of mirrors and mirrors and mirrors, mm. like just endless looking in. And at some point, it's kind of useless. Hmm. I'm with you. Like, is this hurting me more than it's helping me? Yeah. I mean, me and my dad had a bit of a, a debate about this where obviously you can control your thoughts. Uh, you can sort of put things away. You know, if you're in a breakup or grief of any kind, you've got to still have your job and do certain things, whatever, go pick up donuts, whatever it is you need to do. Uh, but I guess we were kind of going back and forth as he's like, you know, choose, choose to move on. And, and I didn't really like that rhetoric, I guess. I guess for me, I feel like if you're feeling something you need to let, you just need to let it happen as much as you can. Obviously, there's times when you can't, but I, I don't know. I, I guess I felt like there were times when I would push myself to socialize, but then I would be out and I would start to feel emotional. I'd be like, I'm ready to go home now because I've got shit I need to feel. I think that's totally OK. You can't like you went out. You went out for a little bit. Right. And you're like, this is enough. Sometimes when we're going through stuff, right, like it might just be 30 minutes that you can go do something. But that's 30 minutes. Like you do not need to have a whole day out with somebody if you cannot emotionally or physically or mentally handle it. <laughs> right. Like, right. That's too much. I, I think I lasted a full hour. Uh, <laughs> so you kind of alluded to this. I mean, you said you were talking to another therapist. Um, Lindsay asked uh, another Lindsay. She said, who does the therapist go to when the therapist needs Therapy. Therapy. I see a therapist. Um, Most of the therapists I work with see therapists. Um, My therapist sees a therapist. So it's kind of this endless line of us um, all seeing each other. But yeah, I mean, I would definitely recommend it to a therapist because we need to. We're taught in school how to uh, kind of compartmentalize. And there are times when like I hear really horrific and heavy stuff. Mm -hmm. And I tell myself like this doesn't the thing is, honestly, after a couple of years of this, I can go home, I clock out and it is done. Like I don't, I'm not thinking about it. I'm thinking about mm-hmm. everything else, but realistically, some of that is going to stick with you, right? Yeah. It's, you know, you've seen the movie Office Space. Of course. You know where they're stealing like a, a like a fraction of a penny every time, yeah, right? It's like after each interaction, you're, you're keeping a fraction of a penny of that interaction. Oh, absolutely. But after over and over and over, it's going to be quite a bit and it builds up. So yeah. Yeah. You know, we have to have a way to decompress and it's on top of having a stressful job. I mean, it's just being a person right now, being a millennial right now and just all the shit that we have to deal with. Um, being a person right now is really fucking hard. And so most of the stuff I talk about in therapy isn't even my job. It's, uh, just life. And Mm -hmm. we utilize each other a lot. I think, um, sometimes we'll, therapist that I work with, we'll talk and we'll just say, I had a really heavy consult. Can I check in with you about this? What do you think? And Mm. we can talk and just say, okay, I just needed to speak that and get it out. Um, Obviously not with therapists we don't work with because of confidentiality and we respect that. But yeah, definitely each other uh, in both like a coworker sense and then like in a formal sense as a patient, for sure. 
You seem like a great therapist. I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting tempted to solicit your therapy. Um, Thank you. So, I, I mean, this is a talking point that I've gone on about. I'm, I'm just curious what you make of this. You know, I, I hear everyone, especially, you know, uh, a lot of my friends and, you know, I, I think a lot of my friends have done fairly well, well in this, but everyone kind of does this thing of like, I know I'm privileged. I know it wasn't that bad for me. It's this, this disclaimer city, you know, but like, what do you make of, you know, and, I, and I've said before, like, I don't really care how rich you are, if you have a girlfriend, if, if you had zero COVID breakups, like this is hard for everyone. Yes. You know, wh- why do we have this inclination to kind of disclaim our pain when we all know that like, this was a seriously fucked up thing. Like this is un- like virtually unprecedented in anyone's history. I, I don't know that there's anyone who was around, maybe I guess during the 1918 Spanish flu or whatever, but like, yeah, what do you make of the, the milieu? We're all kind of steeped in it. Yeah, I think that there is like that. And I've done it myself too. Like, yeah. Um, oh, it's, you know, I have this and I, I had a job this whole time and right, my right. family was safe. And, but at the same time, right, like there are still things that sucked about it. Yeah. And <laughs> like if you're, if you and I are sitting in the emergency room and you've got a, um, a broken arm, and I have like a nail through my skull, <laughs> like right, the right. guy in Happy Gilmore, and like my whole body is broken. Like, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Does it? Does does me being in more pain make you in any less pain? No, no. Like no. it's all relative. And I do think that like privilege is something really important to talk about. I think, and it's something that we discuss in therapy and like examining our own. But there's a danger when things turn into a competition. And I'm not talking about identities or marginalized people feeling unheard. I'm, I, I think more where, and I think I even saw people kind of online, like during this, like, well, if you have this or that, or if you get to work from home, shut up. And maybe like, if you're, if you're having a hard time working from home, maybe don't talk to an ER nurse and complain to them about it, but right. it still sucks. Like things are still hard. If they're hard, they're hard. And that's okay. <laughs> Well put. Um, v asked, when you listen to people's issues all day, some more extreme than others, you tend to get apathetic to some of them. Um, I'm curious about their experiences with that and how they avoid looking disinterested when they feel that way. Mm. For me, not really, because it's just, I want to figure out how to say this without sounding like I'm, it's not compassionate. It's just your job. And like, you're so used to it. Your kind of threshold is different than people think it might be. Like a mm. lot of things aren't too intense. Most of them are pretty easy, like are pretty, um, regular for us, I guess, like we're, we're used to it because it's big to the person again. Like, you know, I've had people who come and they just talk about how they like hate their job and they have a great job, but it makes them so miserable to go there every day. Mm. And that person is just as distraught as someone who's dealing with like, well, maybe not quite as distraught, but you know, like they're distraught the same way someone who's dealing with something really big is. And sometimes when it's something smaller, smaller, quote unquote, like there's still things that need to happen. There's still problem solving that needs to occur. There's still examination and there's still questions that need to be asked. So not really, it really doesn't get boring. And I think like the the part is empathy. They're there in therapy. They're feeling something is wrong, that they want to be better right. and that they want to change. So yeah, you're just there for that. I haven't been bored yet. <laughs> That's amazing. And you I'm easily like you, bored. You're easily bored otherwise? That's incredible. Oh, well, I've got ADD. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it comes with the territory. But no, not with not with people. Not really. That's amazing. I think that's great. I think, I, I, I wonder, going back to what you said, you know, therapists in it for the wrong reasons. I know it's, you know, maybe not the most lucrative side of psychology, but it's definitely a lucrative career and it seems, quote unquote, easy. I can see how at least someone would call it that. Um do you think that that, yeah, what's behind these therapists who uh, maybe aren't really wired for it and they're just, what do, yeah, why, why are they doing it if they're not good mm-hmm. at it? Because Yeah, well, like, I think some people do it because they want to tell people what to do. And Ugh. if you want to tell people Kill what to me. do, you are in the wrong career. Start a podcast called Am I the Asshole? Yes, or <laughs> be any, there, be literally anything else. Uh, right, be a right. doctor. They get to tell people what to do. Yeah. But I think that, like, so I went to school... My degree is in like not at most therapists, they're going to have like letters after their name. There's like an, a licensed yes. professional. It depends on the state, right? A lot of us are like counselors or social workers. That's what our degree is in. But like y- you hear social worker and you think of someone just coming and like taking the kids away. That's really not <laughs> it anymore. True. So I have my master's in social work and I got into it because I, there's a program in Columbus where I grew up and perfect. So it's convenient. I liked kind of like the social justice element of it, et cetera, et cetera. So, but a lot of people that I was in school with were there for kind of moral reasons. So Mm -hmm. they really, 
they want to help people. And I want to help these poor people. Mm. And like, so there's a lot of kind of a savior complex, I think. That was a very rambly explanation. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I went to school with a lot of people who like, I work with a lot of folks who like use drugs. And I, I really enjoy that as a population. Um, and there are a lot of people who they will spend their whole time trying to get that person to stop using drugs, right? Like this person is here because they lost their mother and they're distraught. And um, they also happen to like smoke meth. Uh, I work with a lot of people who use meth. And um, there were people who were like, well, the first thing we have to do is get you off meth. Well, no, we need to deal with this person's grief and the pain that they're feeling like right now. So there are a lot of therapists who get really distracted by things like drug use or things that they kind of deem like wrong, unhealthy. This needs to be fixed now. So there's a lot of moralization, I think, that goes on. There's a lot of like savior complex, I think, that goes on. Um, And sometimes people practicing just outside of their scope thinking that they can do more than they can. Like, so you're a comedian, right? Like if you, if you were just a year or two into comedy and told people like, I've got an hour, I can do an hour, uh, book right. me for an hour. Well, that's more than you're able to actually offer. So right, right. it's really practicing kind of inside your scope, being realistic about things, meeting people where they're at. If someone is not ready for something, do not force them. I love uh, it. Yeah. I, I just know you're a great therapist. You're saying all Thank the right you. things. Because I think, too, I have detected ego in some of my male therapists, um, especially where it is where it is that. And it feels, I, I love what you said, meet them where they're at. It feels like, why are you trying to impose your own kind of way this should go? Just let it evolve naturally, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have a code of ethics we have to stick by. That's part of it. Meeting people where they're at, not forcing them into anything. Totally, totally. Kins asked, and you're going to have to define these terms for me because I don't, I don't actually know these terms. They, they said, ask what approach they're into and how they've managed transfer, transference and countertransference or transference. I don't know. Yeah, transference, countertransference is kind of like um, maybe taking some of your own experiences and putting them into the situation. Interesting. Um, I have never done that on this podcast. I'll have you know. <laughs> no, everyone is constantly <laughs> doing it in the uh, in the Facebook group on the subreddit. But uh, I think managing it by like checking myself, really um, mm-hmm. stepping away. Like there are times where I'll have an interaction with a patient, and I go, "Oh, that person, re- that really, I'm feeling kind of bad walking away from that. What is going on?" And really mm-hmm. thinking about it myself. Um, sometimes if I feel frustrated with a patient in a session, step it like after the session. Um, thinking to myself, what about that made me feel that way? Was that because I felt like I didn't know what to say in the situation and, and I felt incompetent? Um, mm. And maybe I was projecting it out of that person in my head. Um, and sometimes it's like patients will look at you as you're someone in their life, right? Like uh, a mother, or daughter, sister, ex girlfriend, whatever. Mm. Um, and I haven't really had much of that problem. I mostly work with gay men. So. Hmm. There hasn't been much of that. In terms of models, it depends. So with some people like anxiety, there's like cognitive behavioral therapy. But I really like solution focus like your therapist does. And I really love like a strengths-based approach. So, excuse me, strengths-based approach. Like Mm -hmm. what are your strengths and how can we use that to like tackle this situation? Okay, you've got like a sense of humor. You are um, insightful. How can we use that to help you heal with like this thing that you're dealing with? Because everyone on earth is good at something. We all have these strengths. We all have coping mechanisms that we quite don't know we have. Like a lot of people will come in, they'll say, I I don't really have any coping mechanisms. And then you start talking to them and they go, well, you know, I like to work out. I watch YouTube videos. I go to the beach with my friends. It's like, okay, so you do have some coping mechanisms. You might just not recognize it as that. So I really like helping people reflect on kind of what strengths they already have. Mm -hmm. Um, And I do like kind of some of the classic CBT, which is really good for anxiety and these like kind of negative thoughts that we might have that we don't realize we have and Mm -hmm. how to identify those and like accordingly change maybe some negative behaviors that we have. I'm sold. Can we, can we plug you? Are you, can you, you can't do therapy with uh, people out of state. Isn't that a thing? I can't. No. Well, I work for an, like a nonprofit basically. So my patients Uh. all just come through. The nonprofit. So yeah, I'm not like a independent or anything like that, which I wow. really like. Because if people are like, I can't pay, I'm like, well, that's no skin off my back. I don't care. Uh, that you're is not nice. Paying me. Yeah, that removes kind of a transactional layer to it as well. Yeah, and it's just not something I want to do. And no shade on any therapist who want to do that because I I totally understand. And the organization I'm at treats me well, um, and I get good benefits. And 
paid well enough that I would stay there and not do private practice. But there's like billing and stuff you have to do. And nightmare. Yeah. Like all the therapists I've like talked to or read about, they're like, well, when you do private practice, you're like selling yourself like a business. And I'd rather do anything else in the world than like businessy business stuff. So I'm feeling good where I'm at. (laughs) Yeah. Selena asks, how do therapists cope with patients continually, continually not taking their advice and watching clients chronically self-sabotage? Yeah, well, we don't really give a lot of advice. I, I feel like that's re- your, you think that, but I'll, I feel like a lot of <laughs> therapists do. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah. It, what, what do you, like, what's an example of advice that you've gotten? I mean, I, I guess just, just. I, I don't know that I can specifically go go to an example, but I, I think it's kind of what you're saying of like trying to control the interaction, trying to sculpt the interaction too much. I think most of them are wise enough to not be like, oh, there's more fish in the sea, but they are like there there can be this element of, you know, steering things as opposed to inquiring and, and understanding that that's really all I'm on about. Yeah, I think like it's trying to avoid giving advice because right, like you've been you for 30 years. And I've, if Mm -hmm. I'm your therapist, we've met a couple times. So who knows you better? It's definitely you. Mm. So like, you're the expert on who you are. And so for me to like, not take it personally, if someone like if you do give advice, if I say like, and I know you already work out. So this isn't like me telling you need to get this advice. But like, (laughs) <laughs> I said, you know, some people feel like exercise can really help. And if you come in and you say I didn't do it for me to get offended that you didn't take my advice, that's a me problem. That's not a you problem. Right, um, right. If a therapist gets upset about someone not taking their advice, like that's about the therapist. It's not about they're not really doing what's best for the patient. So on the other other side of the coin, you know, are you disappointed when you don't see progress? And, and then on the other side of that, are you extremely rewarded when you do see progress? How, how do you manage that? Yeah. I guess it depends on like how you define progress because we all define it differently. Mm-hmm. Um, a patient, former patient was an actor and had a lot of anxiety. And for him, like sometimes it's reframing goal. We talked about, let's try to like, he got this part that he wanted to, to have and um, he was offered it. It was kind of his goal. And then he got it and he kind of realized I'm not ready for this. And mm-hmm. he declined it. And I was actually really proud of him because he was able to identify what he was ready for and what he wasn't. Yeah. So it might seem like, oh, this person gave up, uh, but I don't think he did. And progress can be, it doesn't need to be this monumental thing. I mean, you're showing up every week, that's progress. Mm -hmm. And like what we see as progress might be defined differently than the patient, right? Like if they're coming back every week, they're getting something out of this, unless they're mandated by the court. So that in itself is progress, like making that connection and that rapport, like that is progress. And I think maybe sometimes if a therapist is feeling like it's not progress, it's kind of the same example of them putting too much of their own desire into a patient. On the other hand, when someone does make progress, yeah, it's really rewarding because it feels like I'm on a team with this person sometimes, right? This patient I see once once a week, it's like we're a team and here's what you can do and here's what I can do. Um, And it's all them. So it's really more them than me. I'm giving them kind of the directions but they're the one who got there and I'm with them one hour a week and they're with themselves the other 23 uh, hours and uh, six days a week. So, right, right. you know, that's all of them. So, but it's really rewarding because I mean, I come to really like the people I talk to and like my patients. And it's like, I see a lot of them on the phone now. So when they can't see me and like, I've had times where someone tells me like about an accomplishment and I like, they can't see me, but I'm doing like the yes, like, like yeah. I'm watching a sports game. Like it, she pumped her arm, everybody. She pumped her arm. I pumped my arm. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, that's exciting. But I would, I think that if a ther- another therapist was telling me that they're disappointed in a patient for having burnout, like I would want to know how disappointed and then like, how much of yourself are you inserting into this? Right. You can't right. work harder than the patient. I love that. I love that. Well, thank you so much for fielding these questions. Um, I did want to talk about the Freudian I saw. He was a, a classical Freudian. That's how he identified mm-hmm. himself. And I would lay down and, and just talk. And uh, he would draw. He would doodle during the sessions. And he was very quiet. He would be kind of just like a go on kind of guy. And uh, I put up with it for a little bit, but it really felt on the last session, it was our fifth session, it really felt like he wasn't listening at all. And I caught a glimpse of his paper, and he was actually not doodling today. He was drawing this rather intricate tree. It was actually a pretty good tree. 
And we were five minutes into the sesh, and I'm like, I'm out. I'm out. You're not listening. You're drawing your tree. Um, and oh I told God. I told somebody this. I actually went on a hinge with uh, with a therapist, and I told her this, and she said, "That's uh, that's the Freudian uh, style. They're they're supposed to make you mad." Well, <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> that sounds so frustrating. If I was spilling my heart out, and a therapist was just drawing like. You know, like that S that we draw in like elementary school. <laughs> Legit, he was. Legit, oh he my was God. a doodler. Yeah, I don't think a there. I mean, look, we're all going to have different opinions, but I don't really think a therapist should be there to provoke you. Um, and there are some good things that Freud came up with, like the idea of defense mechanisms and like projection. But like, he was also a huge creep. Was he? Oh, I didn't know he was a creep. He was I knew kind he was a of a creep. Head. He yeah, loved he coke. Was kind of a creep. Uh, I didn't know that. So, you know, take that with a grain of salt. I will. I will. I, le- I left that therapist. Now I have someone who's much better. All right, guys, we're going to do a couple situations. Let's do this. A-I-T-A. For refusing to go to therapy in order for my girlfriend to get a dog. Okay, so I, 25M, am petrified of dogs. I was attacked by one when I was a kid about seven years old that resulted in fairly serious injury. My girlfriend, who I love deeply and I live with, 27F, really loves dogs. She wants to get one for our apartment, which allows pets. My girlfriend is really passionate about dogs as she volunteered at an animal shelter in high school and college. Like I said, dogs scare me like no other thing on earth. I don't pet them. I don't acknowledge them. Wow. If I see one, I make sure to stay a couple paces away. If my friends have a dog, I invite them over to our apartment or meet them at bars. My girlfriend is dying to get a dog for our home and I've given her a hard no. She responded by, get ready for it people, it's the AITA classic, asking me to go to therapy to get over my fear because it's irrational. Look, I can accept that fearing dogs is irrational at 25. I just got very unlucky when I was young to meet a very mean dog and I probably shouldn't fear them anymore. It's also annoying and embarrassing to have a mundane fear at 25. That said, fearing dogs doesn't have a major impact on my life. Depression, anxiety, addiction. Sure, I would encourage anyone suffering from such serious mental health issues to seek a therapist. I'm not discounting the importance of mental health. That said, I'm not going to spend money and time getting over a fear that has little impact on my life. My girlfriend says my refusal to go to therapy is an indication I don't care about her desires. Well, I believe her lack of acceptance of my fear of dogs is a sign that she doesn't care about mine. Like, my girlfriend hates Chinese food while I love it, so I don't eat Chinese food when we are together. Why can't a dog be like that? Which one of us is being the asshole? Ooh. Well, right away, I'm kind of hearing two things. One, like, I don't know my verdict yet, but I'm Mm -hmm. hearing him say that it doesn't have a major impact on him. But then he's also saying that he can't go to friends' houses who have dogs. He avoids Mm. being around dogs. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if that's true. If it doesn't have as if it does have as big of an impact as he uh, is saying. I mean, dogs are uh, quite popular. I'm finding. Uh, I'm running into these mfs god hourly if I walk around. You know, I, I, I think you're onto something there. I mean, I would read that as a little bit of minimization. How big is the problem, really? And then where I actually definitely lose OP, he doesn't really seem like he's hard. He's, like, kind of going hard on it, but he's definitely kind of equating it to hating Chinese food. And I'm like, that feels distinctly different. No one would call that a phobia. We would just say that's a taste. I mean, it's wrong. It's just as wrong as it's incorrect, but it's certainly yeah. not made of the same psychological stuff as fearing dogs. They're man's best friend. Yeah, I don't think like a she has a phobia of Chinese food. It seems like she could go to a restaurant where Chinese food was being served and right, order, right, and right, order right. something else ah, and it would be okay. <laughs> I can't go back to Cheesecake Factory. Their, mem- their menu is too broad. Yeah, or like, I mean, he's avoiding going places because of dogs. So like, I, on one hand, it does sound maybe a little more serious than, than he thinks, but I'm also wondering, like, how compatible are these two? Because he's definitely afraid of dogs, and she works at, like, a dog rescue, and it seems like dogs are quite a big hobby of her. So right, I- I'm interested about that, too. Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be really hard for me to go all the way into he's an asshole. Mm-hmm. I guess I, I don't really like the, the attitude. He doesn't really seem to—I I guess, let me ask you this. 
it's hard for me, but maybe this is ignorant. It's hard for me to go with OP and be like, A, this is a minimal issue. It feels like it's not as minimally saying, but B, that it's a strictly localized issue, that it really is only about dogs. I feel like there's likely something deeper beneath this. Is that fair or do you think phobias can kind of live in isolation? I think they can live in isolation. I think it's, okay. uh, and it's, tr- it's really, it's quite treatable. Um, really? So you think he would, he would do well in therapy? If he, if he wanted to, but you know, it's kind of, it's hard cause they both really want different things in a few ways. He doesn't want to go to therapy. She wants him to. Yeah. Um, and it's almost kind of like if he doesn't re- necessarily recognize it as a problem, how productive will therapy be? I think couples therapy would be a good idea for these two. Um, oh, interesting. It sounds like they're having a hard time figuring out where the other one's coming from. And yeah, I don't think he's an asshole. Um, it's also scary to confront, like, it, it, you know, and I don't know him. He might yeah. be scared to confront this phobia. He might not think it's that big of a deal. It's also probably when you're really afraid of dogs, it might be hard to imagine having one in your house, even if you're not afraid of them anymore. Like imagining a reality where he's not afraid of dogs might be difficult for him. So the only mm. way he's able to imagine a dog in his house is also in a situation where he's really afraid of this dog. So that's a tough one. It's, I mean, but it's very treatable. Like his, he has some trauma associated with a dog, right? He was, he yeah. was bit by one or attacked. A yeah. Dog when he was young, a formative memory, probably right at that young of an age. Oh yeah. And I mean, at kind of any age too, like our, to, to kind of lay it down, like essentially the part of our brain that controls memory and the part that controls fear, they're right next to each other. Great. So just great. Maybe put some <laughs> space, God. So he's probably having like a, tra- a trauma response and that's, it's yeah. very real and it's probably very, very scary to him. Uh, yeah. You know, I think that there is an Americanization going, see, I'm using all these words that I don't normally use. I want to impress you, Lindsay. Um, I guess what, another thought that occurs to me is he says time and money. And honestly, money, I'm more on board because I'm like, that's mm-hmm. your resources. You know, ostensibly, this guy isn't loaded. Therapy is, it, it's very expensive. I mean, it's very expensive. And I just think like in a, in a situation where therapy is free and provided by the government, for instance, I think this guy's argument would really fall apart. And I would actually kind of be leaning more asshole because I'm like, really, you're not going to go at least see you're not really going to go and just take some time and see maybe eight hours. Maybe this takes 16 hours of therapy. I don't know. I, I don't think this is, you know, a hundred hours. You're not even going to see though. But, but when it's time and money, it's, it's harder to push into him and be like, oh, well, you know, it's like, he doesn't think it's a problem. It's, you know, whatever. And that's a good point. Uh, the money thing, we don't know how much that makes a difference to him. It could mm-hmm. be really financially difficult for him. Yeah. It's, it's very tough. And it, it feels like, this is going to come up at some point. And I would, I would hope that this person would want, and I'm talking maybe as myself instead of a therapist, like I would hope he would want to deal with that at some point because you're going to miss out on a lot Mm -hmm. um, by not having a dog around. Like you, you might need to be prepared to sacrifice this relationship. Is that something you want to do? Like I would really, I think they really need to maybe talk to a professional together if they can, again, if money's an issue, right? Like, yeah, it's very uh, difficult. Yeah. He said he loves her deeply. He did say that. That makes me think, bro, why is this? I mean, I guess really the money thing is a tough thing to work around because like, I mean, look, you're looking at probably $100 a session minimum weekly. That's that's a big expense. That's a car. It is. It is. And the, the thing is, it's to recognize his fear because it's not it's kind of not a fear I can identify with. Um, right. I have not had a phobia like that where I am so deeply, overwhelmingly afraid of something. Um, and that's what a phobia is. It's an irrational fear. So it does sound irrational, but to him, it's very, very real. And it makes a lot of sense to him. So it might feel really scary to get treatment for that or, or to face that yeah. or to relive that trauma. I'm with you. I don't really think there's any room to call her an asshole. I think this is a no. very reasonable solution. And and as you said, this is a big part of who she is. And so he wants, she, you know, she wants a dog around AITA for refusing to go to therapy in order for my girlfriend to get a dog. I think we agree. No assholes I think here. No assholes here. Yeah. There we go. All right. Well, guess what? Here's the flip side of this. AITA for telling my mom's husband he needs therapy when he tried to guilt me into letting him walk me down the aisle. <laughs> my mom married her husband James three years ago I 25F was not living with my mom at the time nor were we in the same state so I haven't really interacted with him a lot I got engaged during lockdown last year we were planning to get married when everything is safe again I asked my mom if she would walk with me she said yes everything was good 
Then James approached me about two months ago saying he would like to walk me down the aisle. That he knows he can't replace my dad, but he loves me and my mom and would love to fill the father of the bride role so I can have someone in it. I told him my mom was filling the parent of the bride role, and that made me happy. He pushed a little, told me it made more sense for him to do it. I said, no. My mom told me he had just wanted to make the suggestion because he felt maybe I'd prefer it. I didn't want to fight, so I left it alone. Then he came back. He talked about how he lost both his girls, his wife and daughters died almost 20 years ago, and how much it would mean for him to be accepted into that role would give him the chance to do that with another daughter. He told me even if I don't want it, uh, would I do that for him? So he would have some healing and a chance to be in the role with someone. I said no again, and he told me I must be very cold to know what it's like to lose a father, to do that to someone who lost both his children and is reaching out and offering to do it for you. I told him maybe he needs therapy if it's so hard and he's so caught up on the loss of them and he can't see me as my own person, as someone who would want my remaining parent walk with me to walk with me and fill that role. He got offended. I'd make the suggestion. My mom bent over apologizing after she heard what happened. I guess she hadn't known the whole thing from before. He's still, I want to say, salty, but he's still offended. And I think I overstepped. And think, thinks I overstepped. Did I? AITA. That's a t- I, I mean, I feel for OP. And I think that even look at the beginning, she made it pretty clear that she wanted it to be her mom. And I have friends whose uh, fathers are deceased or not in their life um, for one reason or another. And they've been pretty adamant that they want their mom to walk them down the aisle. That was the person who helped fill that role uh, yeah. with, their, with their dad was gone. And that is their parent. And it's kind of just a traditional and very like gendered role that we have to have our father do it. Like that, that mother's her parent too. And, mm-hmm. you know, if she had said, well, no one's going to walk me down the aisle, maybe it would be a little different. But she said she wants it to be her mom. It's special to her that it's her mom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, and by the way, Lindsay does not endorse anything I'm about to say. I I have massive, massive qualms with this uh, individual. I I think this guy, this this guy reads as a, I mean, maybe he's highly damaged and he just said this in a moment, but the way he tried to spin this, it makes me physically ill. So first he comes to her and, and off and asks reason. I mean, I think it's an unreasonable ask, but he, he claims he was asking from a place of maybe she wanted it. I think it's a, it's fine. It's fine. I think she was very clear about it. He did push back a little bit, which is, is, I don't love it, but that's fine. He didn't do anything wrong and being slightly pushy. That's fine. Where I really am starting to boil with rage is that he then comes back again and says, so he would have some healing and a chance to be in the role with someone. She says no again. And then this is where I fucking, this is where I'm like, dude, fuck you so much. He then calls her very cold, big fuck you. That's a character attack, wildly inappropriate. Um, says to know what it's like to lose a father, to do that to someone. So now she's doing something to him. Interesting who lost both his children and is reaching out. So I, and I think her response was actually very measured, you know, telling him he needs therapy. I would have said, fuck you. Don't fucking look at me. I probably wouldn't have said this, but that like the entitlement of that reads to me as like narcissistic. It's like, what is going on? You're, you made this whole thing about you. It's utterly delusional that you would, that I already told you. And now you're, you're, and, and, and that you think this would heal all your pain is also like incredibly like off base. What is going on? Oh yeah. I'm nodding my head at everything you're saying. Like it, it's interesting because, and I do think he's making it about him. Like that really, a, a big thing my dad told me is like, when you become a parent, it stops becoming about you. Yeah. And so on one hand, he wants to fill this parental role, but is he really acting like much of a parent? I don't think so because <laughs> he's making it about him. Applause. You know, who is this really for? It's really not for her. I think that's pretty obvious. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't mm-hmm. think she's out of line to suggest he go to therapy um, because he's trying to use her wedding to heal in some way. Yeah. And that's really not, I- I'm sure she wishes her, fa- did, did she say her father passed away? I think so. I think that's what happened yeah. with him. Yeah. And and so unless they had kind of a difficult relationship before he passed, I'm sure she really wishes that her father was there. Right? Like that's that might be difficult for her to not have her father there on that day. And she wants her mother to do it. And he doesn't need to make it any more difficult for yeah. her. And that might be me. I'm probably, I'm assuming her feelings there. But, you know, he's he is making it about him. And also, like you said really well, like he, she said no over and over. Mm-hmm. She said no several times and yep. he needs to respect that because then it becomes uncomfortable for her to say no again. 
and again and again. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I think there's something really about people who take shots like this in conflicts. They start throwing adjectives at your way. You know, you're cold, you're emotionally unavailable. I mean, it's, it's just childish, really. It's Mm -hmm. like, now you're attacking me. You're trying to paint a certain picture of who I am, you know, and then the context of here, I think is that he's basically trying to violate this boundary of hers, which is the answer is fucking no dog. You know, I, I really don't like him. I'm curious, though, what, what you make in general of, uh, I guess, I, I think in a conflict, telling someone to get therapy, I, I would advise against because I, I think it is, uh, unfortunately, it is a charged thing to say in, in the current place. So like if, you know, for instance, you had a big fight with your partner and then during the fight, you're like, you need therapy. I would say that's not good because that's going to be read as uh, there's something wrong with you, even though I don't think that's necessarily true with what getting therapy means. But instead, that's kind of a two days later, we're talking about what happened. Hey, you know. Yeah. What do you, yeah, what do you think of that? I don't think she's an asshole. And I think that like telling someone that you think they might need therapy, it depends on the relationship you have with them. And I think it depends on how you're saying it. I think that she gets a lot more leeway because of the power dynamic. He is like a a parental figure. Yeah. And I think that like children shouldn't be having to tell their parents, you need to go to therapy because of the way you're essentially because of the way he's treating her and acting. He's kind of the one who quote unquote started this. Mm -hmm. Uh, And she, I don't think it's unfair of her to say that to him because she said no over and over. And I think sometimes we, there's this part uh, that thinks we need to have this perfect reaction when someone's pushing our buttons and pushing our buttons, but we've said no several times. Right. Um, And so I think that her response is warranted. And I do think he probably needs to go to therapy to deal with this, because if you're using someone else's wedding to deal with this grief, that's, that's a pretty big indicator that it's impacting you a lot. Yeah, I mean, I think the very logic of that says you got some shit to work out, my dude. Mm -hmm. Coffee Sponge writes, what kind of man has the audacity to ask a woman he barely knows to turn her wedding into his personal therapy session? Does he really believe that a 45 second walk with a stranger is going to cure him? Why is he asking her to give up what she has planned on an incredibly important day just to cater to his wants? I, I I have run into this kind of thinking before with weddings and symbology. There's there's certain people who kind of, you know, they, they feel meaningless and they're looking for this. Because I, I think a wedding is very symbolic, essentially. It's, it's one of the ultimate symbols, you could maybe argue, yeah. right? Yeah. And just people wanting to be involved in a formal sense with a wedding or whatever it may be, a funeral or whatever it may be. And it's, it's a very, I think it's a very ego-driven move because it's like, As you put so uh, poignantly, it's like you're literally asking to fill a parental role and then acting the exact opposite of how a parent would act. Yeah, I think that it's perfectly fine. It's her putting up a boundary. Totally. The second the second he said he needed to use this to heal, I think she she redirected him to the appropriate place to heal, which is therapy. You're right. No, and I wasn't even trying to come for OP when I said <laughs> her throwing out therapy because I mean in this case it's almost like he's spelling it out. He's like, both my kids died, so and she's like, well, yeah. yeah why would that be relevant to my wedding, sir? Yeah, I don't think you were doing that either. It's uh, it's important to like talk about that. People asking each other to go to therapy because it's happening more and more. Yeah, and it's important to identify when that's helpful and when it's not. I, I think I won't at this point date someone who isn't uh, at least 100% open to getting therapy and, and cool with it. Oh, yeah. That's, that's it's where I'm so at. It's so important. It's I'm, so important. I'm doing doubles, Lindsay. I'm doing twice a week. My therapist was like, I think this oh. might be too much. And I was like, I'll tell you when it's too much. I'll okay? tell you when I've had enough. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I think we agree on this one. ATA for telling my mom's husband he needs therapy when he tried to guilt me into letting him walk me down the aisle. We're going a big NTA and James, this guy is James. Get therapy, bro. Go to therapy, James. All right. We're going to wrap up on a final sitch. Lindsay, thanks again. This has been, this has been amazing. I feel this is therapeutic. I would, I would go as far to say. Oh, great. I'm having a great time. So, you know. You'll love to hear it. Come back anytime you need me. Oh my God. I would love that. We can have a segment. Ask a therapist. A-I-T-A for expecting more from my therapist. I started seeing a therapist at the beginning of the year and it's been really helpful. She slowly got me to trust her. I've opened up and I'm finding some tears for the first time in a long time. It's all really positive. She's very good. A particularly major moment was her encouraging me to face my fears and do a video interview for a YouTube It was a big buildup. She gave me pointers. I was scared, but it went well. Given my fear of cameras and public speaking, this was the biggest event in my life for 10 years. Wow. Hats off, OP. 
I go to therapy the next week and she either doesn't remember about the interview or doesn't want to make a big deal of it, I guess. She was just waiting on the Zoom call for what I wanted to talk about, stone-faced. I was really expecting her to be warm and smiley with us, so how did it go at the top of the session? Because she has some part in it. I thought she would be curious. Also, she said I could write her if I wanted. I emailed a couple weeks ago with something going on in my life and didn't get a response. Admittedly, I did give her an out, but I thought she would respond. I emailed again a week later about getting a second session because things are going very bad at the time. She didn't have any more slots that week, but just seemed so cold about it. She told me to call the crisis line if I was in bad shape. It is almost like... It is, if it isn't in the confines of our hour, it doesn't exist. I realize she gets paid by the hour, but it seems she could put in a little effort outside that. So enough little things piled up and I got mad at her in session and brought this up. She said something to the effect of, this is your hour. You decide what we want to talk about, not me. I'm just here to listen. And I can't be expected to be involved in your life at that level. She also says, yes, she has very rigid boundaries regarding getting involved in patients' lives. Maybe she is right and I'm expecting too much or I'm just too sensitive, AITA. Ooh, what do you think? Oh boy, putting it on me. Um, look, I, I think for me, what I expect is I do want some continuity. I want some, you know, I think it is a high bar for to expect how did it go to be the opening line. Mm-hmm. Um, but like I said, I think for me, I, I do recognize, I, I do want my therapist to take notes. They should have the big characters down, you know, they, they should know the basics here. Uh but I guess I do feel I would never email my therapist outside of the hour. I guess I would feel that's not really fair. You know, that that's yeah. my feeling. But I do feel they should be on top of shit. But it sounded like that. I, I wasn't quite clear on the chronology. It sounded like they had one session with this therapist because then they emailed about, quote unquote, getting a second session. And then really, in that case, I can't blame the therapist because I'm like, they're not going to be like in your problem like you are. I don't know if that's a fair expectation. So th- those are my reactions. Yeah. And I'm, I don't know if they've been meeting for a while and it was a second session that week or what. But so first of all, I, I can see why OP would feel disappointed, right? When it opens up and the therapist like didn't remember or mm-hmm. didn't bring it up. Um, and I'm trying not to feel like defensive. Of their, I, feel, I see both of their sides with I'm wondering how I can see why the therapist has these rigid boundaries. Um, I've worked with people who have way too loose of boundaries uh, to the point where like, uh, this is in the past, but people who have like maybe given a patient like their cell phone number or something. And that is, yeah. And not like on a separate lot, like not in 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 a way where they can just contact them at any time. So it's not, it's a disservice to the patient. And the therapist was doing the right thing by saying, if you are, feeling overwhelmed or in danger called a crisis line because outside of therapy, we we might not be there. And that's the appropriate person to point them to. If I have a patient who um, at 11 o'clock on a Saturday night is feeling suicidal, I am more than likely probably not going to be able to help. You know, if I'm out at the bar um, or I'm, you know, I I cannot, I am not in any shape to help that person. I do not have the, it, it would be unethical. Um, and part of therapy, we're not like their kind of crisis line. We, we're there to empower the person and help them to function when, for the times that they're not in therapy. Uh, I, I, one thing for the therapist, and I don't think this is okay. I, I, went, I, I can see why the person felt disappointed uh, that the thing wasn't remembered. We are really overbooked right now. Uh, oh, interesting. And, oh, so therapy's on the rise because of COVID. Oh, yeah. I mean, every therapist I know is over. I, I'm overbooked. Like, I've taken on extra patients. Um, oh, wow. We, all of us are. So there is a lot of um, burnout right now. Uh, most of us are to capacity and taking extra people on. So we might have a limit of how many people we take. And we've increased that just to fill a demand. And even with that, so many people come to us saying, you know, I'm trying to find a therapist. Everywhere I go is full. Wow. So doing this during the pandemic has been very, it's been a lot. Yeah. Um, and I, so if any social workers or mental health workers are listening to this episode, hats off to you because we have not gotten enough, uh, I think, recognition. And not like I need people out banging pots and pans for us, but just we've been working very hard. Yeah. Wow. This is so making me she, empathetic. Go ahead. Go so ahead. That's incredible. So she might... 
And I don't want anyone in therapy to feel worried or that they're burdening their therapist because you're not at all. Um, it, the therapist might be seeing more patients than usual if this was like a pandemic thing. Who knows? Um, but at the same time, like if you are at a point where you're not remembering what your maybe patient is telling you, you need to be refreshing on your notes because we do take notes. Uh, you need to be refreshing on those before you meet with your patient to pick up on where you left off last session because you need to know like who you're talking to and who you're going in to see. And it does hurt from the patient side. I think anyone who's been in therapy has been in a spot where maybe they felt like their therapist wasn't listening or you tell them something and they're surprised and you're like, I've told you this before, weren't you listening? Mm -hmm. So I can kind of see where both of them are coming from. I I'm wondering what response OP wanted from the therapist or what, what they what their interpretation of what their therapist does is. Yeah, I mean, I think they said they wanted this opening line um, that they would be curious. I mean, look, I, I think I, I think what you said is very fair that, you know, you should be on the notes and you should be able to open where you left off. That seems pretty basic and like a pretty easy kind of regimen to, to have, right? Like just at the end of every session, kind of write the final thing and then that way you can open with it, right? I mean, that seems like a no-brainer. OP, OP yeah. also mentioned this email thing. So with the email thing, you, you are saying um, that is probably a line cross for most therapists? I think an email's okay, actually. Um, I tell patients, like, feel free to email me or reach out. Um, I think that's okay. If it's happening all the time, it's going to depend on the therapist. Um, I've never really felt my patients cross any boundaries, but... You know, I've had a patient email me and go like, oh, just want to let you know, like maybe they've been doing really well with their anxiety and it's back. They go, hey, just so you know, it's been really difficult. Um, is that OK? And just letting them know, you know, that's, that can be normal and messaging the back. Uh, I don't think it's aligned across. Some mm. therapists might feel differently. Um, but I do think that like you can shoot your patient a five. You can take five minutes to send your patient an email, I think. Um mm. And it sounded like it, this is also from OP's perspective, but I hear the therapist getting a little defensive almost in some of uh, what OP was describing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I get where they're putting up the boundaries. I'm almost, I don't know if anyone's an asshole. I think part of therapy should be explaining to people what therapy is because a lot of people don't quite understand what it is. And so explaining like, Hey, here's what it is. Here are the boundaries that we have. Here's what I can do. Here's what I can't do. So it is on the therapist maybe to better describe what her boundaries are, what therapy is, what OP should expect going into therapy. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you there. I'm with you there. My, my therapist did do that and, and has laid things out pretty cleanly. Um, but, but overall I'm, I'm with you. I think that what you're saying, which is, you know, lay out the information of how this should go down. And, and I think a therapist has a right. I think it's really cool that you say that they can email you, but I, I don't necessarily think, I just see that as some, as a vector that could be easily abused and overdone. And I, I don't know, I oh, wouldn't yeah. feel comfortable doing it. Um, it, it generally depends. Yeah. I think on the patient, um, if it's to, if it's like logistical, like scheduling, yes, of things course, like of that. course. Um, if it's about like a little victory and it's rare, I don't, I think it depends on the patient sometimes. And sometimes as a therapist, you know, who will and will not respect <laughs> boundaries. Right, uh, right. So, you know, it kind of can depend on the person, but I've always felt people respect mine. Um, I have emailed a therapist once that I had just to let share good news. Um, and be like, you don't have to respond. I'll talk about it in the appointment um, and just less it at that. Mm. But we had also been working together about two years at that point. So we had a pretty good rapport. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But it all kind of depends. Like and therapy, I think there's no black and white answer. It's so built on the rapport you have together. The communication is key. It's a relationship of a kind. And the therapist needs to communicate and the patient needs to communicate to the therapist too. Right. Yeah, I think I think overall we're aligned here. I definitely understand why OP is in pain, but I think that's part of just unrealistic expectation. Potentially, this was the second session ever. You know, I do hate defensiveness in a therapist because I'm like, at least make the other person feel heard. Maybe if you're not going to apologize, at least kind of own your shit. Um, but I, I don't think they really cross the line from what it sounds like. So I think we do agree AITA for expecting more from my therapist. No assholes here. Yeah. Lindsay, I cannot say enough. This is the magic of Twitter. Thank you so much for reaching out. Thank you for listening to the podcast. I'm highly flattered. You called me insightful at one point. I don't know if you meant it directly at me because it, it was sort of in a hypothetical space. But I'm gonna. T I'm giving myself the compliment. 
Um, you're a gem and a half. Thanks so much for doing the show. Oh, anytime. Thanks for having me on. Um, happy to come back anytime. Love the pod. You'll love to hear it, folks. All right. Well, uh, Lindsay doesn't have any plugs, so she wanted to remain anonymous, but we I would plug her. But, you know, that's it. This is great. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>